Hello, everyone. I think we're ready to get started. It's uh, after 7 o'clock. We do have a quorum. Um, I'd ask the deputy moderator to step forward. Um, and um, I want to ask if everyone has uh, an ability to have a seat. If not, we will have to open up another room. Um, there are, I think, a few seats up in the balcony. Um, at least there's three up there. Uh, so you might want to go upstairs. There are an elevator there. Um, otherwise, I will allow some folks to stand if that's what they prefer at the back of the hall. But if you are a um, not a town voter, um, I'd ask that you sit up front uh, so we can monitor the folks that are uh, authorized to vote in the town meeting. I know we have some folks here uh, filming the event other than our town cable services and it's okay for them to do that um, and if you are recording the event uh, that's fine it's your constitutional right to do it uh, however uh, you cannot disrupt the meeting so and if you're not a registered voter in the town you can't vote so I'd ask that you respect the uh, uh, tradition and the uh, our town meeting privilege by voting only if you are authorized to do so or you're a registered voter. Um, we do have a quorum, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Town meeting March 19th, uh, 2024, special town meeting is called to order. And uh, Madam Clerk, do we have a uh, return of the warrant? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Pursuant to the within warrant, I have notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Townsend by posting up attested copies of the same at Memorial Hall, 272 Main Street at the center, West Townsend Reading Room, 264 Dudley Road in West Townsend, Police Station, 70 Brookline Road, Harbor Fire Station, 41 Main Street, and the Harbor Church, 80 Main Street, at least 14 days before the date of the meeting as written, directed, Constable of Towns and Michelle Dold. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, all right, just so everyone uh, knows um, who the people are involved, I'm John Barrett, I'm the town moderator. Kathleen Spofford's our town clerk. Uh, next to her, on her right, is Chaz sexton Duranian, the chairman of the select board. Uh, then uh, Dr. Teresa Morse. Uh, Joseph Shank, our town council, Adam Costa, and Eric Schlegel, the town uh, administrator. And the table down here is our members of, uh, some of the members of our finance committee, Don Hayes, Gerilyn Bazikas, and Sam Grant. Um, and our tre tre treasure collector, Melissa, done it. Sorry, Melissa, again. Okay, um, just to review really briefly, um, our uh, rules of the procedure are conducted under town meeting time. I'd ask that everybody, if you want to speak, be recognized before you say anything uh, by raising your hand, and I'll try to recognize everyone. Uh, direct your comments to the chair and maintain the, de the decorum of the meeting. Um, if there's a motion, it must be in writing and brought to the clerk. Uh, a matter finally voted on may be reconsidered upon a majority vote if a motion is made this evening. If the meeting goes into a second night, uh, an article which has been voted upon tonight would require a nine-tenths vote to be reconsidered. Um, if the vote tally is questioned by seven, seven people, counters will be brought forward to take an actual count. Uh, as you all know, I think we typically will do things by voice vote. Uh, I believe all the articles that we have Oh, let's see. Um, two thirds or majority? Well, the first article is just a majority vote. Um, they're all majority votes. So if the chair is in doubt, we may call the counters up anyway. Um, if you are confused about the situation on the floor, uh, you can interrupt a speaker to raise a point of order. Or you can raise a point of privilege if for some reason you can't hear what's being said or um, there's some, something in the hall that's making it difficult for you to uh, understand what's going on. Um, if anybody brings a, a motion 
to move the question. That is a motion that cuts off debate. It's not debatable. Uh, we would vote on that motion, and if it is approved, debate is cut off, and then we would vote on the motion before us. Uh, so I will ask everyone to be courteous and keep applause to a minimum. Uh, we're trying to get the business, town's business done here tonight, uh, and um, I think we're ready to start. So, looking at the warrant articles, is there a motion on, let's see, try to find article one here. Um, I've got my, uh, here we go. To see if the town will vote to hear a presentation to special town meeting voters on the Neshoba Valley Technical High School budget or take any other action in relation thereto. Is there a motion? Mr. Moderator, I move the town hear a presentation on the Neshoba Valley Technical High School budget. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Is there anything to be said about the presentation? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. I think we can... Say that again. I, I can, and unless seven people r r rise to question the, my call, it is, uh, it is a majority to hear the uh, report. No, we don't go by Robert's rules, sir. This is by like town meeting time and town bylaw. So. Uh, if there is a presentation, and I believe, Mr. Schlegel, did you have a something that you wanted to present at this point about Prop Two and a Half? Because these ultimate motions are going to be subject to a Prop Two and a Half override, so it might be informative for the town meeting to hear this first. Yes, th thank you, Mr. Monterey. Um There, there was a handout. I hope folks were able to to get a copy of it that discussed very briefly about. Prop two and a half in general, and these overrides that are on the ballot or on the warrant in particular. Um, I, I just wanted to g give some folks a little bit of education about Prop two and a half. Um, it was a statute passed at the state back in 1980. Um, it effectively means that the town's levy limit can only increase by two and a half percent each year plus new growth. Um, what that means is the town by itself, by a vote of town meeting, does not have the authority to increase taxes more than 2.5%. It has to go to the ballot. Um, so uh, Prop 2.5 does not adjust for inflation, adjust for, doesn't adjust for cost increases. It's just a, a, a very broad statute that limits the amount of tax increases in a municipality year over year. Um, so. In order to uh, increase taxes more than 2.5%, you're required to have an override. What we have on the, uh, the warrant this evening is two separate proposals for appropriations of overrides. Um, uh, it, it's important to note, the vote here tonight is not to put the override on the ballot. The overrides will already appear on the April ballot. The votes here tonight are to, if the overrides pass, to appropriate the money to, to Neshoba Tech and then appropriate the money to North Middlesex. Um, uh, so the, the, the vote to determine whether the override succeeds is the vote at the ballot at the April town election. Um, this is a vote to take that money if it's approved and put it towards those various school budgets. Um, uh, the, the bottom half of the, uh, the handout that we passed out provided some general information about the impact of the overrides on the average uh, tax bill in Townsend. Uh, this is all based on uh, fiscal year 2024 information because that's where the tax rates exist right now is where we have fiscal year 24 tax rates. Um, so if you look at the average value of the home in FY24, it was about $424,000. The average tax bill was uh, uh, slightly over $6,100. Um, and using that tax rate, our existing levy limit, and the assessed values of property, the uh, uh, additional um, override amount that's in the warrant for Neshoba Valley Technical High School 
um, which is $287,136, um, would increase the average tax bill by $85 a year. Um, so that's about $7.08 per month. It's a, you know, it, that, that's just to let folks know what that impact would be on the average tax bill. Um, the, for North Middlesex Regional School District, the, the uh, additional $1,461,000 would impact the average tax bill by $424 a month or, or $424 a year for a total of $35.33 per month. Now we can all, uh, we can do math in various ways, but we wanted you to have this information so that you would be able to understand the, 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 the reasons why the overrides exist and the, the, in general terms, the impact on the tax bill. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Denise Pigeon, who is the superintendent of uh, all right, question comes on. Well, we have a motion. We have comments on the motion. Uh, Dr. Morris, do you have something? Sorry. I wanted to just add just one little more piece of information by the um, Finance Committee. Um, they did break it down if you want to try to figure out exactly how it impacts you, not based on the average. If you know the value of your house, then it would be 17 cents per $1,000. You could do the math, take out your calculators, for Neshoba Tech override, and $1.7 per thousand for the North Middlesex override, so a total of 124 per thousand for both. Thank you. Comments come on the motion, and now I think we can hear the presentation from uh, Dr. Pigeon. All right, we might need the, all right, Mr. Fanioli, you can. Thank you, will someone be advancing the slides for me? Oh, great, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Denise Pigeon, the superintendent of Neshoba Valley Technical School District. Um, with me here tonight, I have our, our business manager, Michelle Shepard, and assistant business manager, Michelle Bouvet. Um, also in the audience, two members of our school committee representing Townsend, um, Karen Chapman and Sheldon Chapman. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, first slide. Um, as you, most of you are aware, Neshoba Valley Technical School District is a regional technical school district. We serve eight member towns. Um, Townsend has been a member of our school district from 1979. I'm sure many of you in the room have known someone who has graduated from our school um, and or is currently attending. Next slide. Um, before we begin talking about the budget, I'd just like to share a little bit about what, what um, our school district, uh, the purpose of our school district and, and why we are here. Um, we provide high quality technical education to our eight member towns. Um, students participate in one of, one of um, 18 different technical programs and we've broken those programs down into career clusters. And I just wanted to give you some basic information about uh, where the students from Townsend are um, enrolled at Neshoba Tech. So as you can see, 43% of the students from Townsend that are enrolled at Neshoba Tech are participating in either one of our construction or transportation programs. 33% um, are taking um, a technical program in health and human sciences. And in arts and technology, 24% of the students from Townsend are enrolled in those technical programs. Next slide, please. Um, again, before we talk about the numbers, it's really important to understand enrollment. Um, with a vocational technical school, the enrollment is um, pretty much the driving factor in how your assessment increases and decreases each year. Um, a couple of trends that have been occurring at Neshoba, our enrollment, our total enrollment has been increasing for several years. Um, and in addition to that, the interest in attending Neshoba Tech is seriously increasing as well. So interest from our district towns is, is up um, and our total enrollment is up. So we have increased by 42 district students this past year. Um, this is the third year in a row that we have had so much district interest that we have not had any seats available for school choice students. We anticipate this will be the, the third year in a row our freshman class will have no school choice students. Next slide. In terms of Townsend, you're actually at your historical highest enrollment this year um, with 114 students. Um, and that goes all the way back to 1979. This is the highest enrollment you've seen in our district. Next slide. Um, it's important to understand enrollment again because when we calculate the assessments, the number of students attending our school um, from your town 
plus the percentage of the town population and the overall of Neshoba Tech is also important. Those two factors are used in calculating portions of the assessment, which we'll get into in a later slide. So Townsend this year, you can actually see you've had the highest enrollment increase. So 20 additional students from Townsend are now attending Neshoba Tech. Now that occurs for two reasons. You had a smaller senior class graduate last year and you had a larger freshman class come in. Um, again, interest is up and they're participating in those different technical programs that we um, showed on the earlier slide. Next slide, please. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to let you know a little bit about our special populations. Um, the numbers that you're looking up here on the screen is how Neshoba Tech, again, you know that we are a high school, um, how Neshoba Tech compares to our other high schools. So the numbers that are up here are high school to high school comparison, not total school district comparison. I just wanna make sure that, that that's clear. Um, and I just wanted to show you again, just so that you can see the comparisons. Um, Neshoba Tech, 53% of our students that are attending the school um, are considered high needs. We have um, a, a higher than average number of students with disabilities that are attending our district um, and overall high needs. So just wanted to um, let folks see those averages. And also to let you know, this PowerPoint is posted on our website under um, www.neshobatech.net under documents, under financial information, all of our budget materials are in there. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the budget drivers this year, I don't think that this is um, unusual. Most school, school districts are expressing a lot of the same budget drivers that are out there. Um, for us, increase in special education costs in terms of student needs, that's been one of the biggest budget drivers that we've had. We've um, needed to add in some additional special education instructors. We've also needed to add in an additional construction instructor uh, based on enrollment. Um, we also need some additional BCBA support and that stands for Board Certified Behavior Analyst Support. I know there's a lot of acronyms up here and I apologize. Um, really to support some of our, some of our learners and um, paraprofessionals, including RBTs, which stands for Registered Behavior Technician. Again, some, some students require additional support. Some students require one-to-one -one aids. Um, we've seen an increase in that, in that type of need at our school district. Um, in addition, transportation costs in terms of our bus contract have increased. We've also had to add some additional funding um, for special transportation and students that might need special transport to school. Um, the other increases are, are, are pretty typical. That's your step in lane changes for teachers, um, your regular contractual increases, just across the board um, increases in the operations for our building. Next slide, please. Um, other things to think about when we're building our budget each year, we have to think about capital. Um, again, our, our building is aging. It's um, the original building. We have continued to do our best to keep it up. Um, we plan to continue to do that. We enlist the help of our students and a lot of our construction upkeep. Um, we also have to keep in mind that, that there are changes happening to the state formula. Um, the required formula change is in effect with the Student Opportunities Act. And when we get into a later slide, you'll see the, um, the effect in the assessment due to that. We also know that sometimes we don't get the same amount of transportation reimbursement each, each year. That's the revenue that comes direct from the state and sometimes that number can be a little volatile. And lastly, we're trying to be really careful to not be too reliant on one-time funds because we know that if we're too reliant on one-time funds, at some point that could, be, could create a budget shortfall um, and we've been trying to be very careful to not um, have that be an issue. And then there is something called OPEB, um, again, another acronym, I'm sorry, Other Post-Employment Benefits. As a regional school district, we are required to be thinking about um, how we'll pay benefits for people after retirement for our staff. So we do um, talk annually about funding for OPEB and what's possible during a, a particular budget year. Next slide, please. Um, just an update on capital projects. One of the big projects we've been working on, um, we learned a few years ago that our entire fire suppression system school-wide needed to be replaced. Um, we knew that we could not afford to do that all in one fiscal year, so we broke it up into four, potentially five phases. Um, we started with the first phase last year, and that was funded through the, the current year budget. We did those renovations over the summer. Um, the FY25 budget, the only, tech, um, the only capital project that's funded through the budget is to do phase two of the fire suppression project. So last year we did the second floor of the academic wing um, and this summer we're proposing to do the first floor um, of that fire suppression project. 
Other upgrades, um, during this current fiscal year, we just upgraded the elevator. It was our original elevator, so that was definitely time. Um, the other renovations that we have going on, I'm, I'm really happy to share that we've been very aggressive in going after um, competitive grant funds from the state. The state has been fantastic recently with having um, state funding really specified for vocational schools, for vocational training, giving the, given the employment um, outlook that's out there and the need for skilled, skilled workers. So we've been aggressive in going over the, after those grants and we've been really fortunate to receive several of them. So the first one was a cosmetology grant. Um, we've been able to replace the equipment in co cosmetology and we're currently in the process, we gutted it and we're currently in the process of putting it all back together again. Um, we also received a grant to expand and modernize vet assisting and electrical, which are our two fastest growing technical programs at Neshoba Tech. Those renovations, again, all grant funded, not in the budget, um, are underway as we speak. And then next slide, please. Um, again, incredibly fortunate that we put in for another one of these grants and we were actually awarded um, 3.75 million to add 7,000 square feet of space to house our engineering, programming and web um, and robotics program. So this was all direct from the state, really a, a grant designed specific for vocational schools and we were very fortunate to be one of just a handful of schools across the state selected for this. So this renovation you'll see ongoing at our school, it is not part of the budget. Next slide please. Um, in terms of capital, again, we are an old building. We're doing our very best to, to keep it in great shape. If you haven't been to our building, I encourage you to visit. Um, we, um, looking forward, again, we have to finish the fire suppression project. We're doing that in phases. Um, with these grants that we're implementing, when we get the chance to upgrade the fire suppression as part of the grant, we are doing that. So that might help us reduce the number of phases in the future. And then the other big capital project, and it's not for this year, but it's in maybe the year after, the year after that, we're researching um, how to go about doing a complete HVAC renovation. So it's time um, for our HVAC. We're researching several different options, um, which you'll be hearing more about in future years, but it, again, is not part of this budget that's on the table. Next slide, please. Um, just to give you an idea of where we stand in terms of um, cost per pupil, this is a, a figure that's calculated by the state. Um, Neshoba Tech, in terms of cost per pupil, actually ranks on the low end, where 26 out of 29 regional vocational schools in terms of cost per pupil. Um, and these are other vocational schools um, in the area, just to give you an idea. Next slide, please. Um, this is the bird's eye view of the budget. There is a much more detailed budget in, uh, on our website and there were some QR codes out at the table. Um, the major changes are the things that I had already talked to you about in the, in the funding drivers. So we have some additional special education staffing. We have the additional technical instructor for construction. Um, we had to add some paraprofessionals. Those are, the, those are the core of the instructional upgrades that we have. In addition, our ask for the increase in capital for phase two of the fire suppression project was an increase of $25,000. There were also some increases in the transportation contract and special transportation. But that's the, that's the high level overview of our expense side of things. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a visual of our budget and where we're spending our, our funds for our budget. If you add up the, the yellow, which is direct instructional services, and the benefits, um, the purple that are related to those positions, and then pupil services are the 3,000s. Essentially, what I wanted to show you is that just about, you know, about 75%, even slightly more, of our budget is spent on direct services to students. Next slide. Um, oh, I apologize. The, um, the chart doesn't look very nice on that slide. It must be a conversion from Google to PowerPoint. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but what I really wanted you to see from this slide in terms of our budget, so we have our total expense budget and then there's the way in which we fund that expense budget. And there's basically two buckets. There's, there's the funding that comes direct from the towns through the assessments and then there's also the funding that comes from other sources like direct from the state um, or, or, or use of other one-time funds. The next slide will actually help, um, you'll, you'll see a little bit better if you go to the next slide. So this is from a percentage perspective. So 66% of our total budget is funded through town assessments. So 66% of our budget is split over the eight towns when we use the formula at, at the end. 
um, in, in the last slide. 26% of our budget comes direct from Chapter 70 school aid. That's money the state sends direct to us that, that offsets the costs for the towns. 4% um, from transportation reimbursement funds. And then we have some funding going in from school choice and excess and deficiency, which are, are really one-time funds. Next slide, please. Um, the reason, again, why enrollment is so important is because when we begin to calculate the assessment, that's where it begins. So in the assessment slide, you see our eight towns, the number of students that are enrolled in those towns, the percentage of the total population, um, and then the rest of the formula, um, we go through the rest of the formula. The, the, first call, the, the first major column, town's minimum contribution, that is not a number that Neshoba Tech calculates. That's a number that's given to us by the state, um, driven by the state funding formula for education. So that number is not one we create. It's a number they're given to, they give to us, and we plug into the formula, and then we calculate the rest of the assessment. The next, the next column are our costs for transportation or busing students to and from school. Um, also, our capital costs, and for this particular year, it's that one fire suppression system project that I had referenced earlier. Um, additional assessment is the additional funds that we need in order to um, operate the school district. And then debt service is for any debt that we previously had. So there's just a couple of pieces of debt um, that Neshoba Tech still has. Back in 2003, 2005, we did a pretty major building renovation project. That we are still paying for that project, but it is coming, it's coming close to being paid off. Um, and then we have a roof project that, that is on there as well. And then you see the total assessment. So to help make this um, make a little bit more sense specific to Townsend, if you could go to the next slide. So this is um, last year to this year, all eight of our towns, okay? So um, we're up 42 district students overall. Um, you can see what happens to the increase in the town's minimum contribution. And then our increased ask for capital is just over 100,000. Um, our increase ask for, um, actually that's it. And then debt, debt is actually slightly down. And we have an increase for capital and transportation. And the next slide shows you specific for Townsend. So this is Townsend looking at your assessment last year and looking at your assessment this year. So again, the major factor here for Townsend is the increase in student population. You've had an increase of 20 students attending Neshoba Tech. Um, so your overall portion of the district has increased by almost 2%. Um, and then the, the state has calculated the required minimum contribution, which is an increase of uh, about $209,000. And then you can see the transportation and capital request goes up. Again, that's because your student population has gone up. And then you can see the debt has also slightly gone up because of your percentage of the overall portion of students at Neshoba Tech. So the increase in the assessment um, to the town of Townsend for next year is $255,379. And it's really directly tied back to that increase in students. Um, I, I can stop and answer questions here, or I can keep going. I do have a couple more, more slides. I'm gonna keep going. Um. I, I, I don't know uh, how we want to approach this because... probably three more slides and then I can... Okay, okay. Why don't you okay. finish then, Dr. Pidgeon? All right, next slide. Um, I always like to say thank you to our cooperative placement partners. Again, as a regional vocational technical school, our, our goal is to have students um, working out in the field. So many of the business and industry in our area um, will take on cooperative placement students. Spread the word if you know somebody who might be interested. Next slide. Um, I also just wanted to take, take the opportunity to let you know there are other, there are other programs that are offered at Neshoba Tech. Um, we are a, an early adopter to a statewide program called CTI, or Career and Technical Initiative. This is not funded by the towns. This is a state-funded program um, where in the evenings we're running two and three hundred hour programs for people who are unemployed or underemployed and they're looking to be um, retrained and go out into the workforce. We're running cohorts in um, plumbing, in electrical, in automotive, and in advanced manufacturing. And every couple of months we get a new cohort that comes in. Um, we partner with Mass Hire when we're um, working with candidates for the programs. And I just wanted to let um, you all know that that is something that's out there and an option if you know someone who might be interested. They run in the evenings and they run sometimes on Saturdays. Um, and that's, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, we're also open to the public. We have a few, um, a few different businesses that are open to the public. You can call. Um, we do have a restaurant that takes reservations. 
Um, we also have um, automotive and auto body that will service um, district residents' vehicles. Um, and, and Cosmo Cuts is open for business as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pigeon. Now, uh, I'm going to suggest to the meeting that the, the purpose of this article was uh, for uh, Dr. Pigeon to present information, but this is not something that uh, we need to particularly vote on, um, having heard her presentation. So I, I think it makes more sense to take questions that you may have for Dr. Pigeon in, as we take up Article 2, which is the actual vote on uh, the question. So unless there's an objection to that. Okay, so that uh, concludes um, Article 1, which we already voted on, quite frankly. All right, um, Article 2 to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of money for general fund budget expenses for the fiscal year 2025 for the Neshoba Valley Technical High School operating and transportation assessments to the town for fiscal year 2025, such appropriation to be contingent upon the town's approval at an election of a Prop 2.5 override, so called under Mass General Law Chapter 59, Section 21C, or take any other action in relation thereto. Is there a motion? Mr. Moderator, I move <clears throat> the town raise and appropriate the sum of 287138 for general fund budget expenses for fiscal year 2025 for the Neshoba Valley Technical High School operating and transportation assessments to the town for fiscal year 2025. Such appropriation to be contingent upon the town's approval at an election of an override of Proposition 2.5, so-called under Mass General Law, Chapter 59, Subsection 21C. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there anything to be said? No questions. Yes, there was a second. Um, well, I see one hand. Yep, sir, if you could stand. <clears throat> Question, hold on for the mic, please. And yep. could you say, state your name and address, please? Name is Tom Short. Live here in Townsend. What you just voted on, isn't that in the Shoba Valley or North Middlesex? No, we, we, what we previously voted on, the first article was just to hear the report from Neshoba about what they were asking for. Correct. The current motion is to decide whether or not to approve that sum of money and under a Prop 2.5 override. Approve. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other? Mr. Stevenson? I don't know if I have these numbers correct. I thought I had the fiscal year 24 assessment at 1.424 million. And the ask for fiscal year 25 was, I'm sorry, I get it backwards. The fiscal year 24 assessment was 1.362 million and the fiscal year 25 ask is 1.464 million. Is that correct? Question comes on the motion. I think it has to do with the- so It's 102,000 increase. Are those numbers correct or did I get them in error? Okay, question comes on the calculation, I guess, of the uh, amount. Um, based on the information that I have, uh, the, the assessment for FY24 is $1,418,355. That's the total assessment for this, um, this upcoming fiscal year. Um, last year, the total budget for FY24 was $1,000,000. $162,976, so comparing assessment to assessment. Um, I don't know which, where you're grabbing that. So other what's the delta between two? $255,379, and you. that includes the debt. So sometimes in the, in the, in the town um, meeting materials, the debt can be broken out. That, in, that, that figure includes debt. Thank you. Okay, question, comments come on the motion. Any other questions? And, okay. Mr. Therian? Yes, Mr. Therian from uh, Old Pittsburgh, one Pittsburgh Road. Um, I 
don't know if it's a wise idea to combine both budgets into one article. I think the community should be able to review the Neshover budget versus the North Middlesex budget. Okay, okay, Mr. Therrien, we do have two separate articles. This, uh, right now, the article is only for Neshoba. The, the third and fourth article will be on North Middlesex. Okay, so we can do that. In yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, it appears we're ready to vote. Uh, no? All right. Someone uh, in the back? Uh, Josh Abrams, over on 42 Brookline. So we're saying, we're saying that this is going to be an additional 423 approximate dollars a year, right? Uh, no. Um, you're talking about the actual um, assessment per... Correct. Why don't you, you fully state your question, Josh, and then I'll let someone else handle it. I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> you're not so that, that, that seems to be that seems to be right. Okay, excuse me. That seems to be the problem. I don't think the people of Townsend need to spend any more money, right? The people of Townsend should be putting the money in the pocket. The people of Townsend should be paying money to their school teachers. They should be putting money aside for themselves. And money seems to go missing. So now we're going to foot another bill. People can put more money aside so they can hand it in to pay bills that aren't directly affecting them right now. The things that are going on in their town right now. These people work hard. These people go to work, they come home, and then they sit and they look at their bills like I do because Unitil's not cheap, and they wonder what they're going to put aside, where they're not going to spend money, and they're going to do it to send money to a school system that's been in debt for 20 years. They couldn't figure out what to do with the money 20 years ago, so let's fork out some more dollars now. These people deserve to be able to decide what to do with their money, and this isn't it. The teachers, comparatively to other cities and other municipalities, they don't make enough. The people that work inside this building, for the most part, like the town clerk, the assistant town clerk, they don't make enough. They go to work and they grind every single day to figure out what bill they're not gonna pay, and you wanna ask them for more. You should be ashamed of yourself. And I'll tell you one thing, if I don't get elected to sit behind that desk, that's fine. As long as people come out and they vote, to stop you from doing what you're doing, then that works. Okay, comments come on the motion. Um, Ma'am in the front. Um, I just wanted could to- you, I'm sorry, could you state your name please? And sure, my name's Amanda. Um, I just wanted to say that the 424 you're talking about, I think you're just confused because we're still on Ashoba. So Neshoba Tech is 85. So can we just... Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Please direct your comments to the chair. Sorry, I just, uh, we were talking about Neshoba and the numbers he's pulling is for article three, but I thought we were still on two. That's all. Yeah, we're still on Neshoba. Yeah. Yeah. All right, comments come on the motion. Mr. Melanson. Todd Melanson, 79 Clement Road. This question is for the superintendent. Um, the, the increase in busing is, was 14.4 percent. Are you seeing that as an average increase in transportation among all the schools? Um, and how many bids competitive? Did you receive any competitive transportation bids? That's an excellent Good. question. Um, I would say that the increases that you're seeing are like that across the board with, all, with everyone in the region. Um, we did go out for a competitive bid and we received one. Um, and we had a, so we are in a three year contract. The first year of the contract was the highest increase. Um, and we did, we did negotiate with them to bring down the increase, but um, it is a, a statewide issue that we are only receiving one, uh, one bus bid. Did that answer your question? Okay, up in the balcony. Um. Hi, my name is Jim Rock. I live on Regan Road in Townsend. I have a, a basic question. So for Neshoba Tech, we're looking to raise an addition of $287,000. Now, where did this number come from? Is this, like, I think they mentioned a little before what it actually cost Townsend, what's our assessment? Is this in, a, in addition, is this the assessment, or is this, and if it is, why wasn't it budgeted before? I mean, it's, a two and a half override is just something that is very exceptional, okay? 
why didn't did the town not think that that, that um, this assessment's going to be higher this year? So my first question is, what is this two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars? Okay, question comes on the motion. I think what does that two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars represent? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the the two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars is the difference between the assessment for fiscal year twenty-four, which is the year that we're in, and the assessment that the uh, the, the school district has put forward for fiscal year twenty-five, which is next year. So the, we are pre we are preemptively asking for an override for next fiscal year. It's not for the current fiscal year, it's for next year. The reason why there's a difference between the numbers that the district is given and the numbers that the town has is because we, when, when there's a certain portion of debt that's called, that's excluded, excluded debt, which means that, does, that isn't part of the, the Prop 2.5 levy. It's, it's a, a debt that's above and beyond Prop 2.5. It's, it's added on to the, the, the general tax bill. Um, at the end of the of the calculation, so there's a slight difference in what the what the district has, because we have to separate out debt into two separate portions. But this is for fiscal year 25, which is the fiscal year that starts on July 1st of this year. Okay. I'm just surprised that this wasn't already accounted for in the planning for the fiscal year 25. And what happens if it doesn't pass? How are we going to pay Neshoba Tech? do $287,000 if the people do not vote for the two and a half override. Questions come on the article, uh, Mr. Schlegel? Sure, so, so we are currently in the budget process for the budget of fiscal year 25. And the town identified the fact that we didn't have sufficient funds to fund both the assessments for Neshoba Tech and for North Middlesex, so that's why they requested their budgets and we put them on to see if the town would approve an override. Um, that's the, the, those budgets are, are things that we, we got the information from the districts within the last few weeks about what their, what their assessment would be for fiscal year 25 and we're in the middle of that budget process. So is there a contingency plan if, my other question is my last question, and I could also ask the same questions about North Middlesex, which is a much higher number, but my question is, what is the contingency if the town is short to $287,000? Question comes on the motion as to what happens? Well, so there's a couple of things that can happen with regional school district budgets. Um, the, the first thing is that the override gets approved, every town approves the budget, and the district goes forward with that approved budget. The second possibility is that in the case of Neshoba Tech, there are eight member towns. That means they have to have five towns approve their budget. If they don't get five towns to approve their budget, then they would have to come up with a, a, a new budget proposal that lowers the, the assessment to the towns. And then we would have to make a determination as to what we're gonna do at that point. The third possibility is that the, the, the five towns vote for the budget, but Townsend doesn't approve an override, in which case we would have to come up with an alternate source of funds, either by cutting our budget or using some other, some other funding to try to make up that $287,000 difference. Comments, questions come on the motion. Uh, in the front here, uh, who's got the mic? Um, Thank you, uh, Linda Hatch, Seaver Road, Townsend. Um, as far as all of this going up, um, I'm sure it's awful for all of us, but the what is the percentage of senior citizens living in the town with Social Security? And when you look at the $1.24 overall times you know, your assessment, and that amount monthly, you know, which sounds a lot less, is maybe equivalent or less than your social security increase that you got. And so this is just one bill now eating up 
all that you just gained in your Social Security increase per month. What about, you know, everything keeps going up. So I'm kind of looking at what percentage of seniors in town are ending up getting taxed out of the town. That's a real concern for some of us. Okay, comments come on the motion. Um, any other questions or comments? Up uh, in the balcony there, if you could approach the microphone and uh, let us know your name and address. Tom Donovan, it's uh, 109 North End Road. I'd like to know how much money's owed to the town in delinquent taxes before we go for an override. Okay, I don't know if we have that information. Question comes on. Uh, wait, wait. The uh, amount of, uh, I guess, taxes unpaid in the town. Does anybody have an answer for that, gentlemen? Uh, can we get Mike, Dave? Yep. Melissa, hang on. Hi, uh, Melissa Dunnett, treasurer collector. Um, I don't have that information in front of me. Uh, we're still collecting taxes for this year, so we just um, collected third quarter um, as of February 1st. The f fourth quarter is due May 1st. Um, in terms of a dollar amount or percentage, what are you thinking you're looking for? Like a well, if it's half a million dollars, that's outstanding from last year's taxes that isn't paid, we should collect on the debt. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna comment on I think that's too high, but I, I don't think it's half a million. Um, well, in I the past, to, I, I know the town was delinquent. Sir, sure, sure, you know, try to let her answer. Um, I could maybe go to my office. I don't know, I can't, I, think I, this, I don't have the number in front of me. So I'll, I'll give it back to the uh, town administrator. Mr. Um, so, so just so everybody knows, for accounting purposes, um, whether or not the town has delinquent taxes doesn't impact the budget. Because those count, you know, we, when we make a budget, the budget assumes that we're going to collect all of our taxes. If we don't collect them all that year, it counts as a debit on our account, but we're also during that year collecting taxes from previous years. So that's more of a cash flow issue as opposed to a budget issue. Well, we, it's either either in the red or the black. That's how a business works. You're in the red, you're in the black. Sh sure, and I, I understand what you're saying, but what, what, I, what I need you to understand is when we, when we make a budget, the budget is based on the amount of taxes that we're allowed to collect. If those taxes are, are deficient, we still have ways to collect them, but it wouldn't change whether or not there would be a, a, a need for an override. Every year I've lived here, you've gone for a tax increase because of shortfalls. So it's either misfeasance or malfeasance. All right? You either, it, you can't put it together. This town needs to, to look outside. They either need to start allowing people to build houses to bring in more revenue or bring in businesses or something. You can't come every year to the people asking for more. There's not much more. That's all. Okay, comments come on the motion. And anything else? All right, I'm gonna allow Todd one more crack at it, Mr. Melanson. Just to answer the question, I looked it up. Um, the gentleman asked that the tax rate has gone up year after year after year. Since 2018, our tax rate per thousand valuation, in 2018 it was $20.26 per thousand. As of 2024, it is $14.41 per thousand. So you've gone down in six years, it's about, it's about a dollar a year we've gone down on our tax rate per thousand. It's, that's actually on the state De uh, Department of Local Services, and that's what they report to the state. Correct. Okay, comments come on the motion as far as what the town's tax rate is. Um, all right, I think, I don't see any other hands, so I think we're ready to vote. All right. Um, 
Mr. Therian first. Uh, Mr. Moderator, um, I might be helpful um, to get a handle on, on the budget here for people. If we could determine what percentage of the current budget is this increase. So, in other words, I'm trying to figure out, okay, some of this is inflation, some of it is some new students. So, I'm trying to get a handle as what it would be a reasonable increase. So, if we took the current budget and looked at what's going to be with this new budget, I'd like to know the percent of increase on the current budget this represents. And I think we might think of the same approach uh, for the North Middlesex budget. But it, it puts it in better perspective so um, that we can um, get a feel, in other words, how much of this is inflationary, how much is it. And we do know from the superintendent a lot of it's going to capital improvements. Uh, we do know from the superintendent something like 15% is going into an increase in transportation. Um, so if the, if the populace understands uh, better why we need the money and where we need the money and is the money being asked for appropriate for the need as we perceive it. So I, I'm just making a suggestion um, okay, so the question is, can we get a percent, what percentage of the school's budget is this increase? Is that your question, Bob? And then, if we do this override, how, what percentage increase is it to the current budget? Current budget for the school or for the town? Uh, for the school, well, for our share of this quarter of a million. Or okay, million, all right. Uh, I, I don't know, Dr. Pigeon, if you right. have that, or Eric, do you have a calculation as to what the percentage of the increase is? Sure. So the, the based on the calculations that we have, it's about a 26% increase. It's primarily driven by the fact that Townsend went up 20 students. That's the primary, primary driving factor in the increase in Neshoba Tech, is because we are at an all-time high in the number of students that Townsend is sending to Neshoba Tech, and those 20 extra students come with additional per-pupil costs. So that's the primary driver of this increase, but it's about a 26% increase over, the, over fiscal year 24. Okay, comments come on the motion. Ma'am, I'm sorry, your, your name again? Is... Well, no, we need the, um, the uh, video or the uh, Thank you, the Linda Hatch. I just want to address the comment that said taxes were um, at um, $20 and some odd cents per thousand and now down to 14. You have to take a look at your actual assessment. One year, my assessment for a two-bedroom home went up 60000 I called the assessor's office and they said, oh, that's because there's not too many newer two-bedroom homes in Townsend. So my assessment, I did a whole percentage of my street. Mine went up, you know, a lot. But, so you can't go by $20 per thousand down to 14. You have to look at your actual value, okay? Thank you. Okay, comments come on the motion. And I think uh, Mr. Rahala. Okay. Motion's been made to move the question and seconded. Uh, this is a motion that cuts off debate. It's not debatable. I think we might as well do that uh, now. So we've, I think we've had quite a bit of discussion, so I think it's timely. So all those in favor of moving the question, which will cut off debate, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. All right. Uh, the question is before you. Uh, does anybody need me to repeat it? Okay. All right. All those in favor of the motion on Article 2, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. All right. Uh, I think we will 
call up the counters. Um, let's see, Wayne. Okay. Um, Wayne and Rob, do you want to, I think, just take the balcony, okay? Can you guys take the balcony? It's pretty crowded. Can you guys do the floor here? Or do we need a couple more? Yeah, we might need two more counters. All right. You guys do that side and the stage. Um, I'd like to ask everybody who's going to vote uh, either to get one side of the, the floor here or the other. We've got counters upstairs. Um, I need some other counters to count on this side. So, um, uh, Bob, could you count? And um, Nathan, could you count, please? So, you guys count that side and the folks standing, all right? And folks, you, you guys, Nathan, oh yeah, swear those guys in, Kathy, please. Uh, we'll just count this side and to your left of David Funioli. Hold on, guys. Just going to hold on for a minute. Okay, now for anyone, uh, hold on folks, for anyone who was, uh, I guess, uh, filming, and I don't know if people are still here, but filming the meeting who are not registered voters, I'd ask them to step forward so we don't count them uh, mistakenly. Um, and other than that, we've got our counters in position and I think we're ready to go. So, all those in favor of the motion on Article 2, please stand in favor. If you're in favor, please stand. We don't have to do real, real, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's see, Wayne, do you guys have a number? Oh, okay. No. Okay. All right, everyone that voted affirmative, please can sit down and everyone, those in wanting to vote no on the motion, please stand.
Okay. Okay, folks, you can have a seat. Uh, the vote was 158 aye, 43 no. So the motion carries. Article 3. To, to see if the town will hear a presentation on the North Middlesex Regional School District budget, budget. Is there a motion? Mr. Moderator, I move the town hear a presentation on the North Middlesex Regional School District budget. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. All right, Mr. Morgan. Yeah. Well, um, right, okay, That's a good point. Point of order, all right, I'll recognize you. Hi, Robert Lowell, Brookline Street. Do we, um, this presentation that's gonna be shown, is there any slides up there on seniors that can't pay their electric bill? Is there any slides up there saying how seniors are having trouble paying any kind of bills in this town? Because if not, this whole presentation is bias. You should show both sides. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know that there is a definite uh, concern ab about expenses. Um, and I did rush that vote since it seems that this is just a presentation. Does the meeting want to re-vote? I don't know why, what's causing that. You, um, uh, why don't we just do that over again? Is there any, anything else to be said on Article 3 about the presentation? Sir? Bear in mind, make comments of yay or nay of the actual... Jacek Mozdanowski, 16 Alisa Drive. Um, can anyone really see these slides and can read them? Because um, I can't. I thought I had pretty good vision, but I can't. And if majority cannot read them, could we just ask for a summary? Because showing these slides, in my opinion, is not helping much if people cannot read them. Thank you. Okay, comments come on the motion. Still before us is the question on whether or not to receive this report by way of the slide presentation, the PowerPoint or not. So I'm going to ask for another vote on that. All those in favor of hearing the, for whatever you know, benefit it is or isn't, those who want to hear the presentation, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. All right, Mr. Morgan. Hi everyone, Brad Morgan, school superintendent for North Middlesex. I am going to try to present over here so I'm not blocking anyone up front. I um, want to thank Nancy Haynes, our school business administrator, for being here this evening, along with multiple school, school committee members, Lisa Martin, Lisa Bloom, Will Hackler, and Jess Funioli, and the several staff that we have here from North Middlesex as well. Thank you for coming out tonight. So this budget is a little different than what we presented in February as far as a format. At the February budget hearing, we presented a budget with, with really, it came down to just basically numbers. And we also have a budget narrative, which is a lengthy narrative putting those numbers into words. Both of those are, are essentially on our budget website now. Okay, this evening's presentation is going to be a little bit different as to why the override is necessary in North Middlesex. So if you are interested in seeing the original slideshow 
or the budget narrative, you can find that at nmrsdbudget.org. And within the next couple of days, there will also be a real estate calculator on that for each of our member towns. We will be able to enter the information that's presented this evening and find out how it may impact your real estate tax bills. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so some of the district challenges. Some of the district challenges that NM faces have, has not changed over the past several years. The state continues to underfund regional school districts. Back when regionals became something that the state was pushing for, they made promises to regionals. They asked small, smaller individualized school districts to combine to save money. And in turn, the state would help fund them. And in many cases, transportation is one they would fully fund transportation. That is not something that they're doing. In the past couple of years, they've been great about it at 90%, but prior to that, it was at 70. So they really did help us through the pandemic, but now we're being told that it's likely going to tick back to 80%, possibly 70%. Okay, so again, they came close at 90, but they never fulfilled their promise of fully funding regional transportation. Something that is a little different for a regional school district is that we are required to, pro to provide a seat on the bus for every single student in the school district that lives outside of two miles of their sending school, even if they don't take the bus. Okay, so we are required by law to provide a seat for every single student in the district. And that can sometimes be difficult because we have a lot of parents or caregivers that drive their kids to school every single day but at any given moment, could be a snowstorm or um, you know, a situation at home where they have to take a bus and they lose that ride, we have to be able to provide that transportation to the student. The other challenge that we face is that we lack a commercial tax base. Uh, North Middlesex is not considered rural and it's not considered urban and we're also not vocational technical. So we miss out on a lot of the competitive grants that are out there, really the big money grants. So it really does come down to the taxpayers funding the school district. Our primary budget drivers that I'll go over in a later slide are all well above two and a half percent, which is a challenge. Many of those are beyond our control. And our student needs are significant. Right now in North Middlesex, about 25% of our students qualify uh, for special education and about 10% are on federal 504s for some type of, of disability or medical issue where they require accommodations. Next slide, please. Another challenge that we're looking at is that we actually are receiving less money from the state of Massachusetts in FY24 than we did in FY25. Okay, it's not much, but they gave us $22,991 less than FY24. With all of the increases that we're looking at out there, it's, it's extremely difficult for us to maintain services when we're getting less money from one year to the next. Our per pupil expenditures are $1,535 below the state average. Okay, if we take all the students within the district and we go up to that state average, that would be an additional $4 million that we would have at our disposal. We are below the state average now and we're doing great work at the current price that we are educating students for. The other thing that we have to look at is that since COVID, our special education needs have increased and our English language learning needs have increased and all of those items have to be addressed under federal and state law. Okay, so the increases that we're looking at in our budget, we've looked at uh, close to 20 new positions between FY23 and FY25. Those are positions that we have had to hire. We are mandated to hire. So you could call it an unfunded mandate in the state. Okay, students that are on IEPs, have, we have to make sure that those students are being serviced and that their class sizes are appropriate, that they're getting you know, that they have an inclusion specialist that they're working with and all the service providers that come with that, whether it's an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a speech and language pathologist. Those are all things that we have to be able to provide for our students. 
The other piece is, is that we have to make sure, we, we've had a couple of years where we've worked to, you know, catch students up from the year and a half to two years of fully remote to hybrid to coming back fully in person. We're not there yet. Kids lost an awful lot during that time, especially the younger students, and we have to make sure that we are working to make sure that those students are caught up, because if we don't, our special education numbers will go up. Next slide, please. So we, we fully recognize, as has been mentioned here this evening, the impact that this budget is going to have on those on fixed incomes. We're committed to work with seniors, with Town Hall, to identify programs that will help seniors out. We absolutely need your help to give students what they need. The budget that we are presenting is a level service budget. So it's not level funded, but it's to maintain the current services that we have right now in North Middlesex Regional School District, pre-K to 12. Next slide, please. Overall, when I present a budget, it's my job to present a budget that only looks at what do the students and staff need to educate the kids in the school district. That's really the only thing that I, could, that I should be taking into account when I'm developing a budget. Now that said, we have been working with the town managers of all three member districts since August. We've been meeting every month or every other month, literally up until February, trying to make it as collaborative a process as possible, and Mr. Slagle has been fantastic in, in being a partner in that, so thank you for that. But ultimately, it's our job to put forth a budget that's going to serve the kids of North Middlesex to the best of our ability. Next slide, please. So the funding challenges, as I talked about, it's antiquated. We're not getting enough money. I have been told by our state representatives and state senators that change is coming as far as how regional schools are funded, but also comprehensive schools as well. But it's not going to come for two to three more years. So what we're dealing with now is likely going to be something that we're going to deal with for the next two to three years. And already they're talking about FY26 and FY27 being more challenging. And this is not just a North Middlesex problem. There are districts all around us that are in similar, if not more difficult situations than we are. Groton Dunstable, Westford, Acton Boxborough, to name a few. Okay, all of which are struggling. And it's again, meant two of them were regionals. Regionals are underfunded, as I talked about earlier. It's something that has to be addressed at the state level. So some of the items that are usually above the 2.5% increase, transportation, both special education and the yellow school buses. This year, our transportation increase, we negotiated down to a 10% increase for FY25. Much like Dr. Pigeon, we had one bid. Okay, the bidding process is supposed to be an open, and fair bidding process. North Middlesex, Neshoba Technical, it's something, we're certainly not alone. All districts, to my knowledge, are getting one bid because it's something that the Solicitor General does not follow up on at the state level. It's, I've called, I've talked, I've talked to them, and it's the same answer every time I call. We are looking into it, but nothing changes. So we have a 10% bus increase for FY25 and we are required, as I said earlier, to provide transportation to all students in the school district and provide a seat for every single student on the bus outside of two miles. Our health insurance. Our health insurance increase next year is going to be somewhere in between 7 to 11 percent. Okay? In full transparency, we, we lost our health insurance trust. The Shoba Minuteman Trust was something that North Middlesex had been a part of for several years. They dissolved on December 12th and told us on December 12th that effective June 30th, North Middlesex Regional School District has to find another carrier. So right now we are looking at a fully funded program and we're also looking with, with another trust essentially called Maya to come up with a new insurance plan and one is at 7.88% and the other one is at 11.02% for increases. So certainly a challenge there. Staffing um, is usually above the 2.5% and special education costs. 
Okay, and when I talk about special education costs, it's again maintaining compliance with IEPs, but it's also looking at out of district placements. If a student has to go to, for instance, to either the Keystone Collaborative or Valley Collaborative, the North Middlesex is a member of, or potentially to a private special education school. Okay, those are all things that the special education team works on when it comes time to recommend a student, but those again come at an increased cost. Last year, not including the, the two collaboratives, the out of district placement average was a 14% increase statewide. Okay, so again, not just a North Middlesex problem, but a state problem. Next question, please. Oh, next slide, sorry. Um, as I talked about, certainly more challenges for FY26 to FY27. That came uh, last Wednesday at the State Legislators Breakfast, uh, the Superintendent's Roundtable that I attended, and the legislators just obviously wanted us to be in the know with, with the budget forecast moving forward. So certainly something for us to consider um, for FY26 and 27. As I talked about already, the Shoba Minuteman Health Group um, has had a significant impact on us as far as health insurance goes, and also all five of our collective bargaining agreements expire on June 30th. We have an agreement with the Teachers Association, but we still have to reach agreement with the paraprofessionals, secretaries, nurses, and custodians of maintenance. Thank you. Next slide, please. So again, just talking about uh, North Middlesex had a, a substantial amount of money, as many districts did, in ESSER funding, so the federal COVID money that districts received. The problem with the COVID money was that it all has to be spent. It came in three different tiers, and it had to be spent in a prescribed way. So it wasn't something that the district could set aside um, or use you know, for a rainy day fund or something like that. All ESSER funds have to be expended by September 30th of 2024. They all have to be gone, all, all used, accounted for, and we have to report to DESE how that money is being used. North Middlesex used that money for PPE. During COVID, we also helped to fund intervention specialists to help catch kids up. And in some cases, because we had to use the money, we did fund some teaching positions as well, because Last year, for instance, the district cut just over $400,000 from the budget, so we did use some of that money. We do try to stay away from using one-time funds to fund ongoing expenses, but we had to spend that money. Otherwise, it's money that we would have lost. And again, there, there are certain things you can use it for, a lot of things that you could not use it for. Staffing was one. So we used it to help us out um, last year. And it's been great. it was great because, again, especially the intervention specialists, they help catch kids up. But it's, it's certainly something that we need moving forward. And, and we're going to lose all of our intervention specialists at the conclusion of the school year. Special education needs, as I talked about, again, a significant cost supporting students in inclusion settings, sub-separate settings. The school district has multiple sub-separate programs. Um, all of the uh, K-8 to programs, with the exception of one, are located at the Varnum Brook Elementary School in the Nisitissant Middle School. So basically, the K-8 programs are in Pepperell. The reason for that is because it's saved on transportation costs. Saved well over $200,000 a year on transportation costs, so special education vans. It made sense to consolidate the programs all into one location. Service providers, again, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists, psychologists, etc. Those are all services the district has to make sure that the students have access to. Paraprofessionals and behavior tech to support the needs of our students, many of them behavioral needs. Legal services, uh, something that has um, increased substantially is the acronym PRS, Problem Resolution System. So this is relatively new in the state of Massachusetts. If, there is, um, if a family has a question or really a concern or a complaint with something that the school district has done, whether it could be a team decision uh, on special education placement, it could be discipline, it could be a bus stop, um, they can file with the problem resolution system. The problem resolution system then asks the school district for evidence, asks the complainant for evidence, and then 
over a period of time, they will make a decision. Some of those decisions are extremely costly, and the issue with PRS, when I, when I say costly, they're, they're very costly to the school district. In some cases, we've had to hire staff. In other cases, we've had to get a special education van. But the issue with PRS is that there is no appeal. So once the PRS renders its decision, you cannot appeal that decision. And the issue with PRS is that on some occasions, they've actually run counter to the law. And our legal counsel is working with the Superintendents Association, working with DESE, to see what, if anything, can be done. But in reality, it's become a significant cost increase on all school districts. And the big issue is, again, is that you cannot appeal the decision. It's final. ELL needs, um, we've had a significant increase in English language learners in the school district, which has led to increased staffing. That is a mandated um, service that we have to provide. Um, I, I will say at this point in time, North Middlesex has not seen a substantial increase in English language learners from the current immigration crisis, but it's very possible that it is something we will have to look at and have to address in the near future because we have our neighbors um, in Lemonster and Fitchburg which are, have a substantial number of students, but that's usually because they have housing for the students, whether it be hotels or college dormitories, and eventually they're already talking about potentially busing students to some of the suburban school districts. And again, that's something, although it will be funded initially by the United States federal government and state government, it's something that could disappear over time that you have that need that's going to continue. And we do have a class size policy. Um, basically, in K to 8, a elementary class that gets over 25, we have to address that with either a power, with essentially a paraprofessional or another staff member. It really depends on where the issue is. So, for instance, if we end up with a, a Spalding across the street, we have five sections, just hypothetically, of 26 students in a kindergarten class, it makes more sense to hire another teacher that's one person that's benefit, benefit eligible as opposed to five paraprofessionals which are less expensive but all benefit eligible as well. So it does depend on where the increase is and what the need is in order to address that. At the middle school level, it's, you would start addressing class sizes at 28. Next slide, please. I already covered that. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So again, this is a level service budget as I talked about. We are below the state average when it comes to per pupil expenditure. This is from FY 2022. This is the most recent data that is out there with DESE right now. And we, our per pupil expenditure is just under $18,600 per student. Our overall budget increase between FY 24 and FY 25 is 6.27%. Um, and again, just keeping in mind that ESSER concludes. And really, I, I've talked about uh, the budgets uh, in the school district's budget. We have done, again, I, I feel as though we've done an excellent job with the money that we've had. In the last five years, our average increase, even with all those drivers, has been 2.89%. This year, again, we're getting less money from the state. The state counted for just over 1% inflation. Which is, not, which, is, which is not accurate, I think we can agree on that. Um, and again, the costs are going up and we're not being supported. Next slide, please. So we will require a tax override. And essentially, um, again, this will have an impact on your assessment. And I would encourage you again to visit the, visit the, the district's budget website. You go to the next slide. And what would a reduction, if we don't get this override, we have to reduce by $3 million. Okay? And that would essentially be approximately 31 staff members in the district. Okay? So when I talk about 31 staff members, I'm talking about central office administration, teachers, building administration, paraprofessionals, custodians, secretaries. Okay, so something that we, again, will have a significant impact on being able to manage the district, maintain a safe school, but also impact class size. We would be looking at class sizes pre-K to 8, excuse me, K to 8, not pre-K to 8, of 27 to 32 students 
in a class. Okay? So that would be the first step. And then we essentially have to come up with an additional $850,000. Okay, that covers just over two million. We would need to reduce another 850. You can go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, and this would be the elimination of all after school activities. Now, that would be athletics, after school music programs, after school clubs. Now, I know that this has been brought up previously in this district. But I do want to just, the, the option if we have to cut three million is either approximately 31 staff in after school programming or close to 50 staff and we keep the after school programming. If we're at 27 to 32 kids in a class with approximately 31 FTEs being eliminated, if we get close to 50, those numbers, you can imagine what would happen to those numbers. They would, they, would go up, they would go up at least probably two, three more as a maximum, probably up to 35. So one of the issues that we're looking at is that obviously this will lead students to leave the district, leave the high school, look for other alternatives, um, whether it be a charter school or a private school. You can go to the next slide, please. We would also have students that are not engaged after school. Okay, they would essentially be going home. Now, what has the district, what are we going without at this point in time? And I, I know our budget's high, but there are a number of things that we are going without currently, things that used to be in place. Middle school foreign language program, that's essentially twofold. They used to be a middle school foreign language program. That has been eliminated. That has helped save the district some money, but that was also done in part because we could not find licensed foreign language teachers. Okay, so that's it's certainly, we are one of the few school districts at the middle school level that does not offer foreign language but it is it's something other school districts are also looking at because of the lack of licensed or highly qualified staff to teach foreign language. Tiered curriculum directors, we have two um, K-12 curriculum directors, one humanities, one STEM. Many of our neighbors have multiple curriculum directors, <coughs> curriculum directors at the elementary level, curriculum directors at the early childhood, at the middle, at the high school, we have two. Um, so. Overall, again, if we compare ourselves to other districts, we could potentially ask for more. We don't. Um, additional resources for social-emotional programming. Again, after COVID, we have students, um, many students that need additional supports because of COVID um, and just because of the, this, uh, some of the stressors that they're dealing with in life, uh, social media being another one of them, um, where they certainly need support and a lot of that has come back on the school. So making sure that we have the right programs in place to make sure we're able to work with the students that are struggling. Gifted and talented programming. We do not have a gifted and talented program in the district. We do have honors and AP courses at the high school level, but we do not have a gifted and talented program per se at the elementary and middle school level. After school security, um, especially at the high school, uh, we do not have a funding mechanism in place to make sure that we are monitoring who is coming and going after school. Um, so for instance, if there is um, a basketball game inside, um, you know, in the gym, we have to have someone sitting at the, at the door to make sure that people are going where they're supposed to go as opposed to going elsewhere in the building, just from a security standpoint. Okay, so we do not have a funding mechanism um, in place for that. We have lost our librarians at the elementary and middle school level. Okay, those, the libraries are currently being um, addressed with our professionals. In a transitions program between kindergarten and first grade. Okay, something, a readiness program, something many districts have, something that we could certainly use. We do not have um, a transitions program either. Next slide. I think that's it. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, why don't we... Um yeah, direct it through the chair, Sorry. Mr. Morgan. And, and do you want to take questions now generally about your presentation? 
I, I'd, I'd rather, if you have good questions about the presentation, uh, we'll take those questions now. If we're going to have debate about whether, you know, to adopt the, the motion on Article 4, we should reserve that till then, okay? So questions about the presentation, sir? Uh, Brad Hahn, uh, I'm on Brown Road in Townsend. Um, okay. Um, did that presentation of if we don't fund this, having kid class sizes 27 to 30, did that take into consideration what we have here with the MBTA community districts with the 178 multifamily units at 15 units per acre of over 11 acres? Obviously, we're going to have more people, more families moving in. Did that presentation take into consideration all those other kids that are going to be joining our classes and what the impact would be there? Additionally, for all those great teachers that are here and that we, we have the luxury of having, how many of them are going to actually end up moving on if they lose their health care and if they have class sizes from 27 to 32 kids? They can go to other school districts and give those great resources that we get, and we're going to give that up for a cost of 42.50 a month? Seems kind of minimal to me, but what okay, do I know? Comments, questions, come on the motion. <clears throat> Folks, let's, let's, let's get through this. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Thank you for the question. So it does not take into account um, any new development. As of right now, we do base it off of, a, a net, off of what NESDEC gives us, um, which does show um, some level of stability. I'm aware of the project that you're talking about. It does not take into account that. Um, it's based off of current numbers. The, the other thing to consider that was brought up that was a really great point is that um, due to collective bargaining, um, we have to let paraprofessionals know if there is a reduction by May 15th and teachers know by June 15th. And the reality is in, in the current climate out there with education because fewer and fewer students at the college level are going into education. And one of the fears that I have is that we have a hard time hiring teachers now. A great example that I shared at the senior center in, in Pepperell uh, about a week and a half ago was that the Nisitissip Middle School had to hire a guidance counselor through an agency. Now, before I was superintendent, I was a middle school principal and a high school principal. Guidance counselor positions were positions that I would literally get three to 500 applications. The Nisitissa did not receive one application from a qualified person to fill that position. A good friend of mine in a neighboring district called and said, do you have anyone that you could recommend for a middle school physical education position? Again, positions that used to have hundreds of applicants. So the fear that I have for the students is that, again, if, the, if, if we have to make that reduction, many districts are hiring teachers on emergency licenses. We have very few staff members on emergency licenses. I'm pretty confident that if we have to reduce that number of staff, those staff members will be gone very, very quickly because the job market is, there just aren't teachers in it. And the other fear that I have that this gentleman brought up in the back is that if we get to that point and the teachers that are left are looking at class sizes of 27 to 32, I'm fearful that they're going to leave for potentially a better situation as well. So, just wanted to share that. Comments come on the motion or on the dis discussion? Um, Kelly? Kelly Kelly, Five Tourist Lane. I just have two questions. Um, one, do you have an estimate of the percentage of high school students that are in activities that could be affected by this and speak to how that would affect their post-secondary plans? And my other question is, um, 
having a child that is out of district, I know that is always a concern and brings a large cost to the district. I'm concerned as a former teacher that the increase in class sizes could potentially affect our out of district rates by having children who are even less capable of being able to be included in the gen ed program, where if you have a child with autism who may have been able to, with supports, be okay in a classroom of 20, will they be okay in a classroom of 30? And whether or not there's a fear of increasing our out of district rates. Comments come on the motion. Uh, Mr. Morgan. So the first part of the question, I don't have a percentage of kids that are, that are involved in activities, but if you take athletics, music, and clubs, I would venture to guess well over 50% of our students are, involved, are engaged in something. Um, you know, it, it's really, really at the high school level. There are certainly clubs in some middle school sports as well. Um, but really, when you look at the funding, the significant funding is put towards the high school athletic program because that's, it's, just, it's just a much larger program. So I, I would say I can certainly get a more definitive number um, in how it's based over all three seasons, what percentage of kids are involved in the fall, winter, and spring, for instance. But I, I would venture to guess it's well over 50%. And as far as the concern of um, whether or not we would um, run into additional issues. Um, I, I would say most definitely we will run into issues. If we increase our class sizes to 27 and 32, uh, we will have students that are currently on IEPs whose goals we will not be able to meet. Um, and we will have to look at alternatives for those students, potentially compensatory services, which come at a cost to the school district. And we could also look at other students that could end up struggling because of the class size and the lack of attention that they're getting in that classroom and then fall behind and potentially qualify for special education services themselves. So I think it's certainly a concern. Thank you. Comments come on the discussion about the presentation. A um, ma'am over here. Um, well, I. I didn't hear anybody back here. I did see this lady uh, raise her hand. So if you guys have, Teresa. And we got some folks upstairs. Okay. So, ma'am, if you would. Mandy Connor, Walnut Street. Um, I'm a taxpayer in this district. I'm a parent in this district. I'm also a teacher in this district. Just to address your issue, we had over 422 students in middle school as well as high school participating in the fall sports. As of, I think, I just saw it yesterday, um, I think it was 280 for our winter sports, and I believe registration closed yesterday for spring sports. I'm also a coach as well for Unified Athletics. 283 are serviced so far through the middle schools. Um, so we have a lot of kids participating just in sports. It does not include our music department, which rocks, our art department that rocks, as well as our musical that's coming up in April. Please come. Um, so just to give you a heads up, uh, please make sure we invest in our future. Okay. okay. We're going to try to keep it down on the applause because we've got a lot of people that want to speak. It's only going to cut people out from being able to speak. So um, at least keep your applause to a minimum, okay? Um, now, I think, I, I'm sorry, that there was uh, Dr. Morris, um, and then I'll go upstairs to the balcony. Dr. Morris, do you, you want to defer or? I just have a question regarding if you, you, said, you stated in the slides that if you didn't get this uh, package as uh, designed approved, whether it's approved by override or however uh, you get it. You listed most of the cuts as teachers, paraprofessionals, and after school sports. There's a perception, and help me understand if it's an incorrect perception or not, um, that you're, the district is extremely top heavy with positions such as a uh, d director of nursing, which my understanding is they don't actually treat patients, STEM director who doesn't have classes, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, can you address that if, is, if, if it's true and uh, if these positions aren't having a d direct impact on students, why wouldn't they be the first place you go to make cuts? Question comes on the presentation. Thank you. So, so just to clarify, um, the reductions um, would include administration as well, both central office and building level. Um, I, I would not say that, that we are top heavy. Um, again, I talked about tiered curriculum specialists that exist in other districts. We have two that are K to 12. Um, our supervisor of nursing is also in charge of our pre-K um, program. Um, so she, is, um, she works out of the pre-K program every day as well, but just happens to um, facilitate um, the nursing throughout the district and help supervise those nurses because it's extremely difficult for um, someone like myself to do because I don't have a background in it. Um, you, we really need someone with a medical um, and health services background in order to do that. Um, and she's a, super, she's a supervisor. She's not considered a, a director. Her title is a supervisor of health services. Um, so I, I would say that overall, um, I, I think that you, know, you can always use more help. Um, I'm not asking for more help. I'm asking um, or putting in the budget what we currently have. Uh, but also realize that if the budget does not pass, that there will certainly need to be uh, reductions made in that area. Okay, comments and answers come on. The question, uh, ma'am, up the balcony. Hi, Madison Rausch, um, Shirley Road, Towns of Massachusetts. I'm a high school senior at North Middlesex, and I'm part of a student-run organization that recently ran a... Um, a field trip to North Middlesex for eighth grade students where we put together a slideshow talking about um, uh, talking about the extracurricular activities for the music, art, um, sports programs and it was roughly around 80% of high school students participate in an extracurricular activity. Um, should, these, should these activities be taken away from the students, it would greatly um, damage their ability to, to grow and learn and, <laughs> and affect their ability to get into college um, due to these amazing extracurricular activities at North Middlesex, I was able to get into an amazing college and, yeah. Okay. Comments, comments come on the presentation. Uh, I believe a gentleman there in the back. I just have a quick question for uh, Teresa Morse. You're not possibly suggesting getting rid of a healthcare professional at the school, are you? For just to clarify, those children that need an EpiPen, those children with peanut allergies, you, you, did you really just suggest to maybe get rid of that? I, I'm sorry, that seems baffling to me. All right, um, I don't think that requires an answer. Um, Hi, my name is uh, Judy Mader, Turner Road. Um, I wanted to say, no one wants their taxes to increase. We all are dealing with big costs, but without a school budget increase, it's also likely that your home values will go down. Also, many of us seniors had kids in school in this district, and we wanted the budgets passed when our kids were in school. It's time for us to help the next generation. Also, the kids, if they don't have after-school programming, be prepared for more crime in Townsend because kids will have nothing to do and they will find something to do. That's all I have to say. All right. Come on, come on the motion. All right. Um, yep. Uh, Mr. French? Hi, my name is Nathan French. I live on Brookline Street. Uh, I am a lifelong resident of Townsend. I am an alum of North Middlesex Regional High School, and I am fortunate to be a teacher in the district. I teach at Spalding Memorial School and Ashby Elementary School. It has been a privilege and an honor to be a teacher in those schools. I value every minute I spend with my students. It is a delight and a pleasure and a huge part of my life. I am here to support the override. I would hope that you can join me in doing the same thing. It's very important that we invest in the future of our town, 
of our town's children. I don't have children myself, but I am here to support it because I believe in supporting the children of this community going forward in perpetuity. Uh, I believe strongly in a sense of community. Some things are easy. When John asked me to stand up and count votes, I said yes without a thought. That was something easy that I could do to help John and to help the community. Nobody wants their taxes to go up. I understand that. I understand that you will all vote in a way that reflects what you are able to do. But I ask that you make a yes vote in support of this override, not only to support students now, but to support students going forward in the town and in the towns around us in our district. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Comments come on the, the presentation. We haven't even gotten into the discussion about the merits of Article 4. So uh, I, I would like to limit. Uh, um, well, I have to recognize someone. Uh, Mr. Templeton? All right. Okay. Motion's been made to move the question. Um, that will cut off debate. All those. In favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. Okay, the ayes have it. And thank you, everyone, for your comments. I'm sure it will carry on into the next article, um, which is Article 4. And I keep misplacing my warrant here. There we go. All right, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of money for the general fund budget expenses for fiscal year 2025 for the North Middlesex Regional School District operating and transportation assessments to the town for fiscal year 2025. Such appropriation to be contingent upon the town's approval at an election of a Prop 2 and a half override, so-called, under chapter, Mass General Law Chapter 59, Section 21C, or take any other action in relation thereto. Is there a motion? Mr. Moderator, I move the town raise and appropriate the sum of $1,461,294 for general fund budget expenses for fiscal year 2025 for the North Middlesex Regional School District operating and transportation assessments to the town for fiscal year 2025, such appropriation to be contingent upon the town's approval at an election of an override of Proposition 2 and a half so called under Mass General Law, Chapter 59, Subsection 21C. Second. <clears throat> okay, motion's been made and seconded on Article 4. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Morgan for his presentation there, too. Thank you for the participation in the last article. Is there anything to be said on Article 4? Mr. Melanson. Jane, I'll get to you next. So we've talked about what the effects would be on the children, what the effects are going to be on our tax base. One thing we haven't talked about is what it have on the town financially. If you lose the teachers, if you lose the after school programs, there is a good chance the schools will lose their accreditation. Most new incoming home buyers are young families with kids. That means the price, less people will be coming here. That means your prices of your homes, as the lady mentioned, will be going down. Your municipal budget for police, fire, and everything else will stay the same. And the eventuality is, is your property per thousand will go up to meet those demands. Once that change happens, it's very hard to reverse. Um, the other thing that affects it is your bond rating with the state, your ability to loan. Right now, they've done this, the leadership of this town has done a decent job. Our bond rating has gone up, so it doesn't cost us as much to loan money. If that changes, your infrastructure that you need to build, whether it be roads, fixed bridges, will go up. The cost to you will go up incrementally. It's like a set of dominoes. It's the way municipal finance works. We've talked about the effect on the kids, the effect on, on, on the individual, um, but you need to know those facts of the way that works. Um, to Mr. Morgan, I have a question. I've always worked under the premise that it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Um, under that theory, have you ever thought about maybe taking a roster of kids that need the bus and only give that? If we need to kick the state in the butt to make them change their mind on some of this, maybe that's a way to do it. Um, just food for thought. Um, 
But I really want you to think about the long-term consequences it has for you. We've been very lucky as a community. We've got things built for us because we did not have the financial standing to do it. That's two fire stations. That's the library, the senior center. There are a lot of things that have been built for us because we could not raise the funds to do it ourselves. This is one thing that we can do ourselves. It's an ask. Um, Superintendent Morgan said that they have problems with security at after, um, after school events. Does the town have a program to help seniors offset their taxes by doing volunteer work for the town? That might be an area where we can work together to solve the problem um, on some of this. I would rather work together with everybody to solve a problem. Listen, I got no problem standing my ground and telling the state to, mm, um, but this is a problem we have to solve. We have to come to terms with it. Um, you vote what you need to. I'm not here to sway you one way or the other, but you do need to know the reality that it will have on your finance, finances long term for the town. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. All right, comments come on the motion. Uh, Ms. Churchill. Mary Jane Churchville, Main Street, Townsend. I just have one question to segue from what you said, Mr. Melanson. You can't. Hold, hold the mic closer. Or, is it not on? I have no idea. Hello. Hello. There you go. All right. So I, I, to segue to what Mr. Melanson said, that we need help here. So I want to know what is on the town agenda to help the challenge for Mr. Morgan to increase the commercial tax base? Do we have something in place that's happening that can help us? Okay, question comes on the motion about what the town can do to change the commercial tax base. If there's any plan, is there anyone that can feel that? We used to have an industrial development commission, but I don't think we have one anymore. So, so that's a, an excellent question. The, the, the commercial tax base in Townsend, and, and quite frankly in Ashby and Purple as well, is very limited. Um, the, the, um, the opportunities to, to have a commercial tax base that makes a material difference in the, in the tax base that affects the school budget is, is incredibly limited. It would involve us trying to bring in another Sterilite, another Deluxe. And every municipality in Massachusetts is trying to do that exact same thing. It, there, there's, we are, as everyone knows, one of the great things about Townsend is it's not close to any highways. You get away from the, from the hustle and the bustle of, the, of the, the big roads. That's a challenge when it comes to bringing in economic development because we're 25 minutes from the closest you know, four-lane highway. Um, so the, the, the plans that the town has are incremental. And, and are, are likely focused on trying to bring some kind of more robust local sized options. But those things would not materially impact the, the, the school budget and, and not certainly in the, the amount of time that we're talking about to impact the, the, the FY25, 26, or 27 budget. Okay, comments come on the motion. Uh, Mr. Shank. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. First of all, it's a very difficult situation that the board, the three of us, have to try to make all ends meet for everybody, and I understand that. First, I want to say, all the teachers that are out there, you do one hell of a job. You do a great job. You do an excellent job with the children. My grandchildren have gone through, like one gentleman said earlier, he's proud to be a teacher coming through to school. However, we're in a situation that we need to do something here. It's a huge override, I understand it. There are a lot of concerns 
I have to pay those same taxes that everybody else does. But if we don't move forward and support what we need, the children of the future, and this community, I think we're gonna go backwards. Once again, one gentleman said, just look around our community. There's one person that we can thank for all the new structures we have in our community that has really sat and been very quiet. Once again, brand new fire station. We would have to do that ourselves. You think the school budget's expensive? We'd have to buy a new library, a senior center. We would buy a new highway garage. So we really, really are above and beyond any other community where we stand with our buildings. Now we need to put forward to support the school. However, I would only say one thing to Mr. Morgan. I hear this all the time. I'm here in town. Everyone knows I own my own business. The school is top heavy in administration. I, I don't get into a confrontation about that. I would only ask that Mr. Morgan really looks at that, that if there's any way to cut something, because I am so sick of hearing when we have something like this, we're going to cut the teachers. Why is it always we have to pick on the teachers? They're the lifeblood of the community. Thank you. Okay, comments. All right, comments come on the motion. I don't think there was a rhetorical question in there. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Madela on the Hello. balcony. Nathan Madela, 23 Brookline Street. It's really nice to see all of you people here. All the chairs are filled. I don't think we had this kind of turnout the past three meetings that we had. We barely got a quorum in some of them. So thank you for being here. Thank you for exercising your civic duty. Now, I ask that to consider, but before we go to the ballot, and, and keep in mind, I'm for the schools. I want our schools to succeed. But these Prop 2 and a half, so there have been many, many before this. And once we raise the money to pay for what they're for, they don't go away. So maybe I'd like to see like two or three of the old ones go away before I vote on a new one. That's all. Uh, comments come on the motion. Uh, sir, in the, about the three quarters way back, top hat, yeah. <laughs> uh, I spoke already, Robert Lowell, 44 Brookline Street. I agree just to say that I agree that the, it's top heavy. Um, but something I wanted to say to each and every one of you, I need your help. I need you to call your state rep and tell them they need to pass a bill that I proposed. The town administrator can verify all this information. Four years ago, I got solar panels put on the roof of my house. I used to pay Unitil, as you all know, 600 bucks a month during the winter. Now that I get the solar panels, I get a $2,500 credit. Do you think I'm ever going to see that from Unitil? No. So I went to the town administrator with a proposal. I wanted to donate all my credit to the seniors and the veterans in this town that can't pay their electric bill. He took the time, took a week to, to um, research it, found out there's a state law in place. They can only take my new credit coming in, which it took me three years to get up to 2,500. So I called my state rep and asked to sponsor a bill to change that state law to allow me to donate my whole $2,500 because I'm not going to be using it. I called them the beginning of winter 2023 and they assured me they were working on it. They called me after the winter of 2023 and said, now what is it that you wanted? So I have been calling them endlessly. They finally have what's called a, a bill. I don't have the bill number with me. But if each and one of you can call and get this law changed, and then anyone with solar panels and to get, gets a credit with Unitil, if you can donate it to seniors and veterans, that will help everybody out. Okay? So that's all I wanted to say. All right. I sort of was a little bit lax there on the uh, point of order, but um, that's okay. Uh, I think it's a well, good point. 
Um, all right, Mr. Therian. Hold on, Bob. I'd like to comment on a couple of things our, our uh, superintendent presented here. I wanted to ask one question. Um, there must be an association or organization of superintendents, and so uh, I would assume that he participates in that. And one of the common denominators is not just with our school budget, it's coming throughout the town government, is the state making these mandates that are unfunded. And it's showing up everywhere. And um, so you heard the alarm the superintendent said about all these, the foreign languages that we're going to be confronted with. And so I see the state spending money on all these other programs when the basic priority ones, the ones that they were committed to and obligated to when we made this school district, they're, they're ignoring or downsizing. So I think as a community, we really, in order to help ourselves, we have to be responsible with who our legislators are. So um, again, with the superintendent, you know, we can talk about subtle things like, well, do, do the people in the athletic program uh, pay a fee or something to be part of a group? And we can look at a, you know, some of the prolifial positions that are there, but all in all, the presentation is very obvious, and I, I think my impression is the school district has done a good job and the superintendent has done a responsible job. I don't see any frivolous spending anywhere. And so um, I think that maybe with the superintendent of schools and other school districts, with support from our townspeople, that we have to stop these mandates that we have to do this when they're not funding anything. And, it, and, uh, um, and that's our legislatures. You know, they're spending, the Commonwealth right now, if you heard the local news, has un, is, it's, uh, was, had a surface budget last year and now is in deficit. So that only means we're gonna get less and that only means we're going to get taxed more on a state level. So the spending that's happening in, in Boston for Boston programs uh, is affecting us here in Townsend. And so uh, the alarm is that our superintendent said the deduction in transportation, the deduction in um, the state participation uh, I, in another program, it was one of the, some of the first things he pointed out is why he needed to come to us for funding. Um, so I, I, I guess that we have to have a wake-up call here, and I, in, I support what's needed for our school district here. I support what the, you know, the efforts that have been put here and the job our superintendent has done. But we can't, we can't survive alone. We have to get these other school districts to see what's happening. We're getting these mandates for programs and for languages, and, and, but the state's not there to pay for any of it. And so they're... Bob, yeah, yeah. can you kind of I'm wrap it up? I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Sexton Duranian. Uh, Chas Sexton Duranian, 8 South Street. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I just, I wanted to make a couple of comments. Number one, I'm going to um, um, also echo the fact that it's nice to see a full town meeting here. Um, I helped put out chairs, so I know how many chairs are out there, and we've got butts and chairs, and that's important. 
Um, we have a very tough decision to make, and I will say that uh, this Board of Selectmen, we've been working very hard on keeping um, the, the town's budget as level as possible. Um, there are costs of living and there are things contractually that we have to uh, adhere to. Um, we have been, as Mr. Morgan alluded to, that we have been working very closely with the school districts um, since November, October actually, is when we, we, first, uh, we first met. Um, we had said this is what the town can afford. Um, we went through four meetings and all four meetings was the same. This is what we can afford. We have to stay within a certain part of our budget and to be as fiscally responsible as we possibly can, which we have. Um, to this point. Uh, we decided that we were going to um, have the special town meeting so that we could talk about this particular issue with the school budget so that we then can really kind of um, sharpen our pencils for the rest of our budget. This is why we're here today. Um, I also want to add the, the, on a personal level, um, being from a small town, I'm from Irving, Massachusetts, just down the road. I grew up there. And if it wasn't for after school uh, programs, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Um, I was in band and I was in drum corps. And both of those um, uh, has shown me um, a lot of things in life that I wouldn't have had growing up in a very small town like Irving, much like Townsend. Um, we traveled all over and I, I got a, a education in life as opposed to an education in a classroom, which to me was much more valuable. Um, so. I ask that, uh, you know, we're putting this in front of you, make the right decision for <clears throat> the children. Children are our future, and I will support whatever the town decides on this matter. Okay, comments come on the article uh, in the back with the blue sweatshirt. Uh, that you have to be recognized. Well, I'm, no, I'm, no, Gary, I'm sorry, I recognize the gentleman down here, sorry. <laughs> okay. Is that going to me? I, I just want to uh, mention uh, what, one. What's your name? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Mark Hasbrock, 12 Balsam Drive. Uh, my son is a sophomore in high school right now. Um, I know they had cuts in the school last year. I know three of his teachers that he had last year are no longer with us. I'm not exactly sure they left on their own or if they're cut, but they're not there. Um, he, he is a good student, but he also uh, participates in after-school activities and sports. Some of those after-school activities that could be cut are academic activities, not just sports, and some of them are volunteer groups um, that give back to the community themselves, one of them being Best Buddies, where they work with disabled kids in town, and another is um, Giving Tree, which raises funds for underserved and financially struggling families. Um, you're cutting more than just teachers, you're cutting aid to the community as well. Thank you. Okay, comments come on the motion. Mr. Shepard. Okay, motion's been made and seconded to move the question. This will cut off debate on Article 4. It's not debatable. All those in favor of moving the question, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. All right, the article, the motion is before you, Article 4, I think we all know what it's about. All those in favor of Article 4, say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it by a majority. Is there anything else to be said? Hold on, we're not done yet. I'm looking for a motion to, re to dissolve the meeting. Move to dissolve, second? Second, all those in favor say aye. All right, this meeting is dissolved.